Alistair Crowley has always appealed to me because he stands out among all the great mystics of, of, the, of the world in being the most egregious case. Uh, the, the, there are some pretty weird mystics in all traditions and some that look like they were part time crazy, but there's nobody quite compares to Crowley. Uh, Mary uh, Daste Sturgis, who was Crowley's mistress around 1911 and wrote the introduction to his book for, she said other religious leaders say, believe me, Crowley says, don't believe me. Now that's what I find most attractive about him is his constant uh, skepticism and uh, don't, don't believe me, uh, try uh, the exercises and find out for yourself. He uh, studied uh, most of the schools of uh, consciousness alteration that existed in his time. He studied yoga with the Hindus and the Buddhists and various different types of yoga, Hatha yoga, Gnani yoga, Raja yoga, Tantra yoga. He, he learned a lot about Taoism in China, where he became an Yijing expert long before there were any others in the Western world who knew anything about Yijing. Did his own translation of the Tao Te Ching. Studied a little Sufism in North Africa, evidently. He was the, the leading authority in his time in Western, uh, the Western occult tradition. And he picked up bits and snatches of all sorts of other things in his travels around the world, uh, including a great deal about uh, shamanic traditions that use drugs to alter consciousness. Uh, he, he knew more about that than anybody before the 1960s. Uh, so all in all, uh, uh, reading Crowley's books, you, you, he gives you, in uh, most of his books, he gives you a lot of exercises uh, along with the theory. And if you start doing the exercises that Crowley gives you, you find your consciousness does alter. And then you find the universe alters, which, of course, is inevitable because the only universe you know is the universe in your consciousness. So this is kind of confusing to some people. But uh, this combination of do the work and uh, don't uh, don't uh, believe anybody's dogmas, draw your own conclusions after you've done the work. I, I like that approach. Crowley put it into a poem once, uh, which I'm fond of. We place no reliance on virgin or pigeon. Our method is science. Our aim is religion. I think that's a terrific approach, especially when you look around at so many things that are called New Age that are so gullible and uh, uh, medieval. The uh, uh, people who uh, you feel you could easily sell them the Brooklyn Bridge if you were inclined. <laughs> they, 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 they'd they go and get the savings out of the bank and hand it to you right away. Uh, compared to the gullibility and superstition in most New Age centers, Crowley is really refreshing, like cold water in the face, really wakes you up. Um, what about some of the stories of... Uh, and smashing a glass by looking at it, the Oxford dem demonstration, and then the, the stories I've read about uh, the psychic war that carried on with uh, S. L. McGregor Mathers. Is that, is that correct? The guys, I'm not getting his name correct. There's a lot of interesting uh, stories about Crowley. Uh, and I don't think there is yet a really good uh, biography of Crowley. They're all uh, they're all biased. Most of them are biased against him. The, his man and enemies got into print before his friends. And there, there are several books that portray Crowley as a raving monster and a uh, uh, demented uh, maniac, uh, sadist, and whatnot. And uh, then his friends or admirers started writing biographies that 
are equally prejudiced and try to portray him as the magus of the new aeon, the, the uh, utterer of the word of the law, which will transform the whole planet to higher consciousness sometime in the very near future. We are supposed to have entered, according to the Orthodox Prolians, we are supposed to have entered the Aeon of Horus in 1904. And uh, if you ask what is the evidence, well, uh, the world certainly has gotten a lot weirder since 1904. <laughs> uh, when the Aeon of Horus fully manifests itself as an open question, is it going to take 500 years or is it going to happen in a in 2012 like everybody else's prophecies well I don't know but uh, meanwhile we've got all this literature about Crowley some of it absolutely incredible I, one of the most widely uh, published uh, stories about Crowley is the time uh, he and his son McGregor uh, went into a hotel room in Paris and drew a uh, pentagram and invoked the devil and in the morning McGregor was found dead of a heart attack and Crowley was off his head and had to spend six months in a mental hospital and never quite regained his intellectual faculties that story has appeared in quite a few books the fascinating thing about it is it first appeared in a work of fiction, a novel by Dennis Wheatley Dennis Wheatley was the head of the Double Cross Bureau of English Intelligence. Crowley was a part-time employee of MI5. Uh, each one of them uh, seemed to have been highly suspicious of the other. Wheatley had a tendency to believe that any conspiracy he wasn't supervising personally was the work of the devil. And, uh, well, the Double Cross Bureau had some real weirdos in it anyway. It was a, Besides Wheatley, Ian Fleming worked in the Double Cross Bureau. You see what kind of rich fantasy life he had when you read the James Bond novels. And Alan Turing, who invented the Turing machine uh, problem, also worked there. Anyway, Wheatley's invention uh, in, in, in the novel called For the Devil a Bride about Crowley and his son invoking the devil. There are lots of weaknesses in this story. Uh, for instance, Crowley never spent any time in a mental hospital in France. And for another thing, his son McGregor never showed any interest in magic or in Crowley's occult studies. And for a third thing, uh, McGregor, Crowley, didn't, uh, didn't die of a heart attack in a hotel room in Paris, and uh, the most clinching argument of all is uh, there, was, there never was a, a son named McGregor Crowley. The whole thing was made up out of a whole cloth. There's not one fact in that. Now, that's typical of a lot of the legends about Crowley. Once you start examining them, you find out they were created either by Crowley out of his wicked sense of humor or by his enemies out of their total lack of humor and uh, it's very hard to find out what to believe uh, I didn't, uh, it took me a long time to decide whether or not to believe he worked for English intelligence but the, the evidence has accumulated enough that I believe that although it sounds like something he might have invented he did invent some pretty tall tales about himself the uh, English intelligence service that was uh, what, prior to and during World War II? Uh, it was during division. World War II. Oh, Pro during Crowley World. evidently worked in the propaganda division. Among other things, he uh, proposed the sign that's identified with Winston Churchill, the V for Victory sign, which is invoking the powers of uh, Sat, uh, the Egyptian uh, donkey-headed deity that uh, Crowley regarded as uh, a good mischievous spirit to set against your enemies. Uh, Crowley did various other things for English intelligence. All the details are far from clear. Um. Uh. 
Jones. What about the uh, the rivalry between him and Essel, McGregor Mathers, and that supposed that I've read some things about like McGregor Mathers set a swarm of rats or locusts on this house. I mean, then they were like in different parts of Europe when this was going on. Crowley's uh, a <laughs> psychic and uh, propaganda war with McGregor Matthews was real. Uh, was the typical of the kookiness of the occult world. Um, McGregor Matthews ar arose to the position of outer head of the Golden Dawn, which was the primary magical order in England at that time. Yates and several others decided Mathers had become a tyrant and perhaps a megalomaniac. Uh, they unseated him and formed a rival Golden Dawn, claiming he was unfit to lead. Uh, Crowley sided with Mathers, and uh, Yates developed the opinion that Crowley had set demons upon him because of his rebellion against Mathers. Uh, and then uh, Crowley and Mathers had a quarrel, and they uh, each accused the other of setting demons upon them. Uh, but they finally got to court because Crowley and his magazine, Equinox, started publishing all the secret rituals of the Golden Dawn. He announced that the secret chiefs had authorized him to do this. This is the kind of thing that cannot be judged in the court of law because the secret chiefs did not take the form uh, in space-time where they can testify in the courtroom. The secret chiefs exist uh, only uh, where the square root of minus one exists, uh, the white rabbit of Alice in Wonderland. You, you've got to be in a special state to contact the secret chiefs and no court is quite equipped to do it. So if one guy says, the secret chiefs told me this, and somebody else said, the secret chiefs told me the opposite, there's no evidential way of judging between them. You just decide uh, which one you think is crazier than the other. So anyway, Crowley uh, claimed the secret chiefs authorized him to publish these rituals. Mathers tried to stop it. Uh, the trial turned into uh, all sorts of irrelevant issues such as whether Mathers had or had not alleged that he was the reincarnation of King Charles I, uh, which Mathers didn't want to answer on the witness stand for fear of prejudicing the jury, but was compelled to admit he had at times claimed to be the reincarnation of Charles I. There wasn't Charles II, I think. Uh, and uh, there were various innuendos about Crowley's sex life, which Crowley enjoyed very much, although most of the other people <laughs> did not enjoy it. Uh, Crowley really uh, had a a weak uh, spot for um, he didn't mind how much trouble he got into or how much pain he caused uh, those around him. But he had a chance to do something that would shock the British public. He'd go ahead and do it. And uh, uh, the most amazing thing about his life is that he stayed out of jail. He lived to be 72 and never spent a day in jail. It's amazing for a person with his temperament. Everybody I know who remotely reminds me of Crowley has spent time in jail. You can't have that attitude of uh, deliberately flaunting society's rules. I think Sinead O'Connor is going to end up in jail eventually for instance. Uh, Crowley was sort of a cross between Sinead O'Connor and uh, uh, Madonna in, in a male form. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, that's, that's another of the interesting Crowley legends. And Crowley predicted uh, he, that he would reincarnate to carry on the work of initiating the new Aeon, only when he came back it would be as a woman. And you'd be surprised how many women I've met who claim they are Crowley reincarnated. Uh, it's a long, long list. Uh, the one I find most plausible has never made the claim. That's Madonna. She she has her own shtick. She doesn't need the claim. She probably did. <laughs> She's got a big enough audience already. Um, what? 
what other legends of, uh, I don't know how to describe these events, uh, I don't want to say supernatural, but uh, what other legends are there around Crowell besides the, the glass smashing demonstration, of, I think that was, was that at Oxford? The most fascinating uh, to me of uh, the occult site of Crawley, uh, there's, there's many sites to Crawley. You can tell, you can look at Crawley entirely as a linguistic philosopher uh, in the tradition of Wittgenstein. It went even further than Wittgenstein. There's a book called Portable Darkness, an anthology of Crawley's writings, which the editor pretty much interprets Crawley as a linguistic philosopher chiefly and makes everything else secondary. But if you do want to look into, uh, there's many ways of looking at Crowley. I like to look at him as a scientist in the consciousness alteration field, a pioneer, a forerunner of Tim Leary and Stan Graf and uh, John Lilly and all the great consciousness researchers of the last 30 years. Crowley was 50 years ahead of everybody else. But uh, on the occult side, the, uh, the most fascinating uh, thing is the Book of the Law, which Crowley was, first of all, one of the most notorious practical jokers of his time. He was responsible for numerous hoaxes. It's very difficult to tell when he's kidding and when he's serious. His books are all written. That's part of his way of keeping you on the key vive, making it arousing curiosity so you will try the experiments and uh, also keeping you from just accepting things as dogma. He's constantly playing games in his style. Is this serious or is this another of his jokes? And he did perform some outstanding hoaxes. One of the most famous was the Hail Mary hoax, which was a book of hymns to the Blessed Virgin, allegedly written by a nun, it turned out to be written by Alistair Crowley. And he explained after the hoax was revealed that he wrote the poems to Isis, but he thought since the Virgin Mary is just the modern version of Isis, it could be just as easily presented that way and would have a bigger audience. And he, he was there were lots of fascinating hoaxes that he was involved in. And then there's the Book of the Law, which is allegedly a communication from higher intelligence about which Crowley was very cryptic. He said he got it from his holy guardian angel. He told one disciple, the holy guardian angel is not in any sense your higher self, uh, like, the the like in theosophy and a lot of occult movements. It's a separate being of much higher intelligence than a human. Uh, he told another disciple, the holy guardian angel was just a metaphor for your own unconscious. So he directly contradicted himself, depending on who he was talking to. The, um, the, and he was a well-known hoaxer. Nonetheless, everything he ever wrote about the Book of the Law, he insisted he was serious this time. He was not hoaxing. Of course, the best hoaxes all begin that way. I'm not performing a hoax this time. I'm being serious. He insists the Book of the Law is a revelation from higher intelligence. It's not a hoax, and that he has suffered throughout his whole life from the duty to speak the truth as revealed in this book, no matter how much trouble it made for him. And that uh, is, I suppose, the first, the major koan and Crowley, uh, Crowley's uh, system, uh, which is called Thelema. He didn't want it named after himself. He was terrified that he'd come back in 2,000 years and find Crowleyanity had become as reactionary as Christianity. So he insisted on it being called Thelema, so at least uh, it, it was named but not be disgraced, whatever his disciples did with the movement. And uh, Thelema, Stop a minute. Okay. Uh, you can edit this. Okay. What the in the in the Thelemic system there are koans just as in Zen Buddhism. There are points in Zen. You're studying Zen. You're, the Roshi gives you a koan to work on. A riddle like what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or who is the master who makes the grass green? Or 
Uh, Corley has Colans built into his system, and I presented as Colans. They you just run into them, and you suddenly stop. And what am I going to do about this? What, am I going to believe him? Am I going to think it's a joke? Is there a hidden meaning? And the big Colan is: uh, Do you believe in the Book of the Law, or is it just the one joke that he kept a straight face about for most of his life? And uh, it's fascinating how different people react to that. Uh, I find it fa I find it fascinating because the book of the law does seem uh, it's uh, it's just spooky enough to keep you guessing where it came from. Israel Rigardi, who studied with Crowley in the twenties and later became a Reiki and psychotherapist in Los Angeles, Rigardi suggests that Crowley had nine personalities at various levels of the psyche and uh, the deepest level was uh, he gives names to these in terms of all these magical titles and the deepest level was Awas which uh, is not only uh, the deepest level of Crowley's unconscious if I understand this it's the deepest level of the human psyche it is the collective mind of humanity and that was speaking through the Book of the Law, according to Rigardi's interpretation. Uh, it certainly is uh, an interesting challenge to try to decide uh, that, uh, especially since uh, they have yeah, so much reason for just dismissing the whole thing and deciding, well, Crowley is just the biggest hoaxer who ever lived. Uh, by the way, the... Uh, there are five branches of the Ordo Templi Orientis, the magical order of which Corley was the outer head. And they all denounce each other as bogus, which is as it should be. Uh, and trying to get into a magical order, you should have to go through intelligence tests of deciding whether you found the right one or not. The uh, English branch under Kenneth Grant has pretty much uh, taken the position that the intelligence behind the Book of the Law is an extraterrestrial uh, from the system of the double star Sirius. I find that very interesting because, uh, well, no, that's a, I don't think I'll go into that. That's a, that's for a, that's a topic for some other evening, I think. I, I think, uh, well, why? I'm especially interested in serious and extraterrestrial sending communications from there. Uh, I'll let that pass this time. Uh, uh, people probably want to get to sleep anyway, and they don't want to get they, they don't want to get too weirded out at this hour. Um, what about the Book of uh, Lies? I've, I've s there's several um, musicians, uh, recording artists that are into Crowley. Uh, I'm digressing a bit. Uh, Daryl Hall, I think, is a member of the Golden Dawn. Uh, I saw one of the members of a group ministry saying that you should read the Book of Lies, that it will change your life. Would, uh, how do you compare that with the Book of the Law? And the Book of Lies is one of my favorites of Foley's books. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say which is weirder and funnier and more mysterious, the Book of the Law or the Book of Lies. I guess the Book of the Law has more perpetual shock in it. Uh, every time you go back to it, you get shocked again and shook up a little bit more. The Book of Lies is a lot funnier, uh, but it requires careful study. It's got so many different kinds of jokes in it. Every chapter, the number of the chapter is important. There are capitalistic jokes about the number of the chapter in every chapter. There are jokes within jokes and anagrams and acrostics. And every conceivable way of saying ten things at the same time and keeping you confused about which ones are serious and which ones are jokes and is, is there a difference and uh, many times uh, you'll find the passage where the surface meaning is conventionally religious 
talk, not, not in the ordinary sense, conventionally mystic. It could be Lao Tzu or Buddha or uh, some Sufi. It could be any great mystic. And then you suddenly discover there's a dirty joke hidden under that. And you think, boy, what a mixed up mind he had. He was a real weird, what a weird sense of humor. And then you find the dirty joke has behind that an allegory which takes you back to the mystical level again. And then you find out you can interpret it in terms of uh, Freudian or Jungian psychology and that Crowley obviously understood that and wanted you to see that. Then you wonder how many more levels you can find. And it gets funnier and funnier. Uh, it sounds very, it is very intellectual, but it's very funny too. It's a, it's very intellectual humor. Like uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Mathematical Logic in which he proves some dowagers are thistles. Uh, he, has a, he, has a, he has a perfectly logical proof of that. And uh, the Book of Lies uh, is uh, that kind of humor. Uh, he, he even wrote a commentary on it, which is even funnier. A commentary in one place, uh, he talks about some of the logical errors he committed in that chapter deliberately violating the rules of logic just to confuse the people further. And he says, but to, after listening to errors in logic, he says, but to explain this further would set the book beyond the understanding of the common reader in Oshkosh for whom I am writing. And of course, the common person in Oshkosh is not going to understand more than three lines of this book. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I place it uh, pretty much in the same general area as Finnegan's Wake. It's not as great as an artistic achievement as Finnegan's Wake, but it's equally funny and equally inexhaustible. And uh, the more you dive into it, the more you find. You can go on for years and years, just like with Finnegan's Wake, finding more and more meanings and more and more jokes. How, um, in the Book of the Law, and I'm not from what I haven't really poured over the Book of the Law and the Book of Laws. Uh, in fact, that is, is every time I go into a bookstore, I can always usually find the Book of the Law, Book of the Law but I rarely ever see a copy of the Book of the Laws. How does one who's just maybe investigating Crowley for the first time get beyond all the hidden meanings and the and cryptic? Do the well, if I get a hold of uh, Magic, which is three parts of Book Four, and don't ask me why the publisher left out the fourth part. The doings of publishers are even more mysterious than the doings of magicians. I think the publisher is Samuel Weiser. I'm well, I'm not sure of that. But anyway, Magic uh, has uh, the Book Four has has four parts. Magic, uh, Magic and Yoga, uh, no wait a minute, Yoga, Yoga and Magic, Magic and Philosophical Commentaries on the Book of the Law. And the book called Magic consists of the first three. And it's full of exercises. Uh, so the more confused you get by Crowley, the, the more motive you have for trying the exercises. And if you try the exercises, it's absolutely guaranteed that you'll get more confused. Uh, but you'll also begin to see light where you never saw it before. The world becomes, as Crowley says, a continuous ceremony of initiation. How, um, what do you recommend as far as uh, experiments or rituals for someone who has no experience with Crowley and what level do you start or what? It's Crowley. Um, uh, he wrote a little poem to help you remember that. My name it is, my name is Alistair Crowley, because that I am holy. My enemies say Crowley and wish to treat me foully. So now you'll never forget how to pronounce it. It's Crowley. Crowley. Um, how do you feel, uh, What's, what, is there a certain lineage, say, with, between uh, Mathers and you know, you know, Levi and Crowley? And, uh, 
do you think there's a certain lineage there? Yes, that's one of the things that got me involved in the study of Crowley and his works. This is the one area where the rationalist approach to history absolutely breaks down. If you try to find out the truth about any of these magical societies that Crowley was involved with, especially the Golden Dawn, the Auto Templi Orientis, the Illuminati, uh, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, and uh, about, <laughs> about 20 or 30 others of less importance that he was involved in at one time. Or do you find every one of them, you, uh, the, the trail uh, disappears into fog. Beyond a certain point, everything becomes uncertain and mysterious. It's like the intrusion into this world of another world. Uh, how, do, how does John D and, and is it, I, I don't know if I pronounced the name correctly, Eliphas Levi? How do they pronounce his name? Eliphas, I think. Levi. How do they fit in with the Order of the Lineage? And how the, the, the Golden Dawn and the Ordo Templi Orientis are separate, but I, s I see them as very similar. I mean, they, they, they seem. But they are two separate or entities or other groups, aren't they? Mysteries within mysteries, endless mysteries. Alphys Levy uh, seems to be the enemy of the kind of occultism that Crowley uh, was involved in. Crowley translated one of Levy's books and always spoke highly of Levy, praised them to the skies. Eliphas Levy wasn't Jewish, by the way. That was a pen name. He was actually a Roman Catholic mystic. But his uh, Crowley despised the Catholic Church even more than Sinead O'Connor does. Crowley, when Crowley refers to the Black Brothers, uh, the doers of evil who have set a spell over mankind to put us in slavery, he means the Roman Catholic Church. It takes a while to decipher that one, but Crowley was one of the leading anti-Catholic uh, uh, revolutionaries of the last couple of centuries. And yet here he is uh, uh, in the same party with this Roman Catholic mystic who wrote under a Jewish name. But that's the way it was. Uh, the magical world is full of these mysteries and paradoxes and false fronts. And uh, um, John Dee um, was Queen Elizabeth's astrologer and a great mathematician. And... Uh, he got some fragments in a language which uh, several uh, linguists claim is a real language, not just gibble gabble or uh, made up or pretense. It's a real language, but it's not a human language. And uh, the D was D bright enough to invent the language, but maybe he was. But it turns out a century before him, another magician named Pico della Mirandola in Italy. Uh, got a few other fragments in that language. And, of course, in the Golden Dawn, Crowley learned to use that language, which is supposed to allow you to converse with angels and Achaean spirits. Grady McMurtry, who was the caliph of the Auto Templi Orientis until his death a few years ago, he told me he asked Crowley once when it was safe to summon the Anakian spirits, and Crowley said, you don't have to summon them. When you are ready, they come for you. Uh, the Auto Templi Orientis and the Golden Dawn are officially uh, very opposed to each other, and yet I, without mentioning names, I don't want to give away too much, I, I know somebody who's the leader of one branch of the Golden Dawn and a member of the Auto Templi Orientis. There are at least three branches of the Golden Dawn in California, each of them denouncing the others as bogus. Then there's the new reformed Orthodox Order of the Golden Dawn, which doesn't claim to be genuine at all. And then there's the fake Sufi school, by the way. There, you know how many orders of Sufis there are running around California all claiming we're the true Sufis, the others are all fakes? Well, there's a group called the fake Sufi school up in Nevada City for the fake Sufis. But, um, 
What about the is it the Rosicrucians? What uh, about the order? Uh, I mean, there's a, I guess there's a few. There's one in San Jose. And there's a yeah, the, the the gang in so there's a there's another Rosicrucian order in Pennsylvania. The gang in San Jose who do all the advertising got their charter from Foley. They got their charter uh, from Foley. Sure of that. Uh, Foley says so. Others say so. And a student of uh, art folk history, I know, uh, tried several times to get them to show him their charter, and they just kept evading and making excuses. They don't want. They don't want to be connected with Foley. <laughs> oh, they and don't. yeah, that's where they got their charter from. Why they Foley was the head of the Rosicrucian order in Europe at one point. Why do they want to uh, disavow any connection to Crowley? Because the Hearst newspapers uh, have, have left this uh, heritage uh, behind that uh, Crowley is a Satanist and uh, uh, <laughs> and a very evil person in general. But, but along with, I guess, with John Bull in England calling him the wickedest man in the world or something. I thought Crowley invented that himself, the oh. wickedest man in the world. <laughs> Um, when he takes the name, or when, when did he take the, the, the number 666, and was that just kind of a, uh, a rebellious kind of reaction to his, uh... That's another mysterious thing. Uh, he, uh, he implies that somebody else did it first. In one of his early poems, he uh, says... Didn't he say his mother, at one point, his, or not in biographers, he said his mother called him the beast? Yeah, uh, he, he, that's very vague. He did something and his mother called him a beast. He's probably masturbating. Um, that's the kind of thing. That, uh, that's, that's, I think that's the most plausible guess because the, it's described in such uh, evasive language. Uh, but the 666 thing, uh, yeah, a very early poem he has these lines by all sorts of monkey tricks they make my name mean. 666. Well, I will deserve it if I can. It is the number of a man. So apparently somebody else did it. But he did it himself several times in uh, the, you know, the complete Kabbalah of Alistair Crowley. He has four or five different ways in which he can get his name to add up to 666. Alistair E. Crowley, one way and Alexander Crowley, which was his birth name, another way. And he got to add up 666 uh, several different ways, including creating a magical name for himself, Tomegatherion, which adds up to 666 in Greek and means the great beast. Uh, yeah. I, uh, we were talking about how we... Uh, adopted the, uh, the name, or the number, 666. Yes, uh, then uh, the 666 appears as a number of evil in the book of Revelations of St. John, who apparently ate too many funny mushrooms uh, on Patmos and had a lot of weird visions. Uh, it sounds like he got into the wrong kind of mushrooms as far as, well anyway, be that as it may. Um, Crowley's deciphering, uh, Kabbalistic deciphering of the uh, Book of Revelations led him to the conclusion it should be read in reverse. It's sectarian propaganda for the Aeon of Osiris, warning against the Aeon of Horus. Uh, but since we've now entered the Aeon of Horus, we've got to turn everything backwards. So 666 becomes a positive number, as it was uh, in the last day on the Aeon of Isis. Uh, it's the number of the sun, capitalistically. And uh, when this came up in one, in one of Foley's numerous appearances in court, uh, the prosecutor asked him, do you not use the number 666? Is this not a number of evil? Crowley says, not at all, it just means the sun. If you want to, you can call me Sunny Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the time he had his first art show in Greenwich Village. 
and a critic from the uh, New York Times asked him, to what school do you think your works belong? And Paul, he said, I'd rather imagine I'm an old master. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, he was a great put-on artist. Anyway, 666 does symbolize the sun, and uh, as uh, John Michel in his book, The View Over Atlantis, points out, it appears in a lot of Christian architecture. There was a Gnostic underground tradition that recognized the positive meaning of the sun archetype. And Jungian terms, Coley uh, identified with what Jung calls the solar phallic archetype. which I think is clear enough and doesn't require, you know, all you got to do is open a few pages of Crowley and you get the solar and phallic energy coming at you right away. You don't even have to read Jung to find out what solar phallic means. Um. So the Rosicrucian order in San Jose got the charter from Crowley, Crowley and um, there's I, I think no the Rastafarians probably owe even more to Crowley. Rastafarians too? Yeah. I, I think their religion is a lot pro closer to Crowley's teachings than the Rosicrucian uh, gang in San Jose. Uh, this uh, this I intend as high praise to the Rastafarians. They may not quite see it that way, and I hope they don't misunderstand me. Um, there's probably, I guess, no way to really, if, if they even do exist, uh, of proving whether any of the Rosicrucian orders are actually trace their lineage back to the original if there really ever, there's even debate of whether Rosicrucians ever really existed at all, isn't, isn't there? Oh yes, there's uh, one school of uh, historians who believes the, that somebody, some person or persons for unknown reasons put out three pamphlets announcing the Rosicrucian order and then didn't do anything else to follow up on it and it was all a big hoax. It, uh, I don't know, people who can believe that, they're, they're, they're the kind of people who believe if you throw junk over the fence for four billion years it'll turn into a 747 jumbo jet in operational order. How do you, uh, how does the, how does alchemy and, and the Kabbalah tie in with all, all, well not all of these, but I mean groups such as the Order of Templar Orientis and the Golden Dawn and Rosicrucians. And does it does it tie with Masonry at all? Is that I mean, is that probably is that one of the main foundations of, of the uh That is such an enormous question. Yeah. Uh, masonry, Rosicrucianism, alchemy, Kabbalah are all related in a variety of ways, but disentangling them and explaining the historical uh, connections and how it all happened is almost impossible because no two authorities agree and uh, there is, like I said, everything disappears into fog eventually. I decided, one of the, at one point I decided uh, that uh, the uh, masonry in the 18th century, which we, uh, we know it existed then, there's a lot of debate how much further back we can trace it. I'm inclined to accept some of the evidence that we trace it back to the 17th century. And then it gets more and more debatable, but anyway, it was there in the 18th century. And I figured out the 32 degrees and the 33rd at the top of the honorary, um, it corresponds to the Tree of Life well enough that there must have been Kabbalists in on the creation of Masonry. And probably there were, there were lots of other Masonic Kabbalistic elements in Masonry, but the 32 degrees weren't invented until Albert Pike in the 19th century, who was a Kabbalist, and he put a lot more Kabbalah in 
masonry. So there was some Kabbalah in masonry from the beginning, and then more got put in by Albert Veit, who incidentally said the star, the star on the floor of every Masonic temple represents Sirius. That's an Audrey Moore. Uh, uh, but I mean, do you think that is the bulk of, of masonry founded, or the bulk of Rosicrucianism founded on, on the Kabbalah? Is that, or are there other, uh, what other uh, elements are there to the Hermetic, what's called Hermetic thought, uh, which was a combination of Gnosticism, Kabbalah, uh, and alchemy, had an underground existence in Europe for about a thousand years. Every time the Inquisition discovered any of it, they arrested everybody and burned them at the stake. But it still went on as an underground force, and it used various fronts, and among these fronts were the Rosicrucian movement and later Masonry. Then later, still in the 18th century, Masonry got taken over by I think, I've been studying this a long time, so I have a right to an opinion, even though I, I, it's only an opinion, I can't claim to have the absolute truth. In the 18th century, it got taken over by a rationalistic group who wanted, who used masonry chiefly as a way of trying to end the religious wars that were tearing Europe apart and to establish the modern kind of democratic state in which there is no established religion. You might say the most enduring product of Freemasonry is the First Amendment to the American Constitution, which says Congress shall establish no religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, which leaves it up to everybody to decide what religion they want and doesn't allow anybody to go out with an army and try to destroy somebody else's religion. That is what masonry mainly was involved in throughout the 18th century, and they finally succeeded by the early 19th century. That was the generally accepted idea of civilized countries. You still find the older idea that the true religion should destroy all the false ones in backward and barbarous places like the Mideast or Northern Ireland. But in the civilized world, masonry has triumphed. How does the, the does the Martinist order tie in with uh, masonry and, and Rosicrucianism? Is that are they affiliated or related in any way? The Martinists were uh, involved in uh, hermetic. Uh, practices and uh, they, they relate to the Golden Dawn, the Auto Temple Orientis and similar occult orders and backwards to the Knights Templar probably. They, uh, they use the word Illuminati also and sometimes get confused with the Bavarian Illuminati which seems to have been more political. Uh, the uh, there was a lot, uh, these things, uh, yeah, if we can separate them in, into categories, but in history they weren't always separated. They blended, came together, and parted again. And Like Mozart's uh, magic food is a uh, Masonic ritual disguised as an opera, uh, which is pretty generally recognized, but uh, buried underneath it there's a, uh, there's a political, uh, th there's a lot of propaganda against uh, the monarchy and in favor of democracy. And there's also, uh, according to some interpretations, there's a hidden plea in there to admit women to Freemasonry. In the magic group? Yes. Um, each degree, I mean, there's 33 degrees. You said this, the 33rd is, uh, is honorary. It's not. Is it, is it separate from the other 32? Yeah, the 33rd. The 33rd is just given for uh, being a mason for a long time and doing something outstanding. It's generally it's given, for instance, to everybody who gets nominated. Every mason who gets nominated for president gets elevated to the 33rd degree right away. Just by uh, virtue of being nominated. Well, 
first they got to go uh, go through all the degrees they haven't gone through, but that can be done in a weekend. They have a special weekend crash course. Where you can go through 32 degrees or... Well, um, well or most people have reached at least the fourth degree. The general tendency is uh, to encourage people to go to the fourth degree and then not discourage them to go further. Only those who are really curious. Is there a real mystery here? Uh, are the ones who go further up to until to, they finally reach the 32nd where the ultimate secret is revealed every 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 degree has a very complicated and beautiful ritual except the 32nd you were saying the other degrees uh, there's, there's a beautiful ritual in detail except for the 32nd Yes, the, the rituals of masonry are so beautiful and so intellectually coherent and teach such powerful moral and spiritual lessons in terms of such emotionally moving drama that you can't uh, study the system without feeling there was genius at the highest level involved in the creation of masonry. I'm not saying every mason is a genius. A lot of them are. Uh, well, the masons that I have the greatest regard for all spend most of their time bitching about why can't we get the right types anymore. Into <laughs> the, uh, the order. You mean? Yeah. The. Uh, I mean, you know, they, uh, they used to get people like Beethoven and Mozart and Haydn and Voltaire and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and. Uh, people like that, and uh, now who do they get for probably the vice president in charge of loans at the local bank? Uh, anyway, the, the 32nd degree, there's no ritual. The candidate comes into a room, and there's a little screen, and a chair in front of it, and he, he sits in the chair, and from behind the screen, somebody speaks to him and a voice he recognizes and tells him just how he thinks. And there's nothing dramatic about it at all. <laughs> but it probably changes them for the rest of their lives. Can you say astounding things? How do you elaborate on that? Absolutely not. No. Um, let's just say that was among the many initiations Crowley went through. He went through many others. You said that in Ceylon and in India and North Africa and uh, other places. Um, you said that for the thirty-third degree, if someone says at least up to the fourth, they can go through all the other degrees in a weekend. Well, if they're if they're nominated for president. Uh, it's part of the tradition that there'll always be a 33rd degree in Mason before they enter the White House. Now, we got two uh, right now. <laughs> we got a president and a vice president who are both Southern Baptists. I, I would be willing to bet money that at least one of them is a Mason. I, I bet both of them are. Uh, Jesse Jackson's a Mason. Uh huh. Prince Hal Lodge. That's one of the things. Everything, everything is less beautiful than it looks. Masonry could have been so beautiful and could still be, but uh, it's been segregated a long time. They keep the black people in the Prince Hal lodges and the white people in the Scotch Rite lodges, and it's oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I and mean, they don't let women in. Well, they do in some lodges, but they. they the lodges that do it are generally condemned by the United Grand Lodge, and uh, uh, masonry still has a way to go. The, um, the, the, the rituals, the degrees are all the same. It's just that they, I mean, no, there are different. Uh, the Scotch Rite has the 32 degrees, the and the honorary. That's the biggest in the United States. The Grand Orient Lodge, I forget how many degrees they got. They are the ones that are continually getting into trouble politically every century. Uh, and uh, the Order of Memphis and Miserum actually has 97 degrees. Pro 
Foley got all 97 of them, but that was that was one of those. Uh, I almost said swindle. That that was one of those magical. Uh, he, he gave all the Masonic degrees he was entitled to give to Theodore. Uh, what's his name? Uh, and in return, uh, uh, that guy he gave Foley all the degrees up to the 97th in the order of Marcus and Mizraim. What, um, some people just get into this, uh, collecting, uh, Masonic degrees. <laughs> if, if you, uh, uh, Crowley once sent a telegram to, uh, Arthur Wade's in which he signed it with all his Masonic titles. The telegram consisted of the one word, yes, and the titles taped up about nine pages. <laughs> um, I think it was an answer to uh, the last sentence of Waite's Encyclopedia of Masonry, which is something to the effect, after all this investigation, is there one anywhere on this planet who claims to know what the original secret of Masonry was? I, I think that was what provoked Crowley to send him the telegram saying yes. <laughs> um. When people are say at a lower degree, are they aware of what the rituals or the initiations are for the degrees above them? Well, they can. They, well, uh, they can uh, be. Uh, they can find out if they want to, but it would be wiser for them not to. Uh, that is to say, you can go if you have the time and the patience. It doesn't take long. You hunt around used bookstores, and you can find enough books on the secrets of masonry revealed to find out what's going on. But if you're going through the initiations, it's better not to know. It's better if you, uh, well, you, uh, you, never re you never recapture the thrill of seeing Indiana Jones uh, in the Temple of Doom or whatever the hell. You, you never recapture the thrill on the second or the third viewing, right? It's better to be surprised. Yeah. And it's better to be surprised at magic rituals than to know what's coming. It, uh, it also biases, I suppose, your, uh, your uh, outlook on the results or the, the process. Yes. Uh, do you feel comfortable going in, in, into any of the degrees that you received, or I didn't take that off? No, I prefer to remain mysterious. Okay. <laughs>